Good evening, everybody. Um, glad you all can make it uh, for this edition of uh, our, our Scrub uh, Twilight Workshop. Uh, tonight, we're, we're covering greens bubblers uh, and looking at best practices for cleaning, sanitizing, and design. So um, I think we, we might have a, a good crowd tonight. Uh, so in the chat box, if you could, um, you could uh, put in your name for farm name, just briefly uh, where you are. Um, do you use a bubbler um, already, or are you just interested in learning about it, or uh, uh, whatever brings you to our meetings? It would be, it'd be great to find that out. And um, in, in what crops do you wash with a bubbler? I mean, uh, we, we always talk about greens, but are there, is there anything else uh, that you're using um, a bubbler for? So if you could just pop that into the chat, chat box that's there. Uh, and hopefully somebody will be reading those. Uh, <laughs> and if you have any questions uh, during this, uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have some time to, uh, uh, with our panelists uh, to ask questions at the end of that. And then uh, further on into the, into the workshop, there'll be another opportunity to, uh, to ask some questions directly. And then we can, um, also, uh, if you have some something specific, uh, you just want to like throw that into the chat box. We will get to it. All right. Next slide. All right. So this is kind of the overview of uh, what we're going to cover tonight. Um, we just want to go out and just go over uh, the bubblers, uh, also called aerators, uh, and then we'll have our panel uh, of growers tonight. Uh, McCollum Orchards with Rich Woodbridge and Back Porch Produce Farm with uh, Sherry Little Stressing. Um, then we're going to go over best practices for cleaning and sanitizing, um, then key improvements, um, design ideas. Uh, and I think you're going to see a bunch of that tonight as well. Um, and then, um, you know, what, what, what folks might be thinking about as far as their own bubbler setups. Uh, we'll get some feedback from you. Um, and then we we'll go over some available resources. And then um, when you sign up for this uh, project, um, we, we're, we're asking all participants to, um, to, to do a little bit of improvement themselves and let us know about it. So we'll, we'll just touch on that and have more questions and answers at the end. So I'm, I'm Hans Ester, and so part of the introduction here, and I'm one of the uh, University of Vermont of uh, uh, folks in the scrub program and just you know real quickly the scrub it, it, we're really excited about this project it's a three-year project it's sponsored by the USDA FSOP it's multi-state and that's a very cool thing we got um, we're working with partner farms really to develop these um, you know the resources so some of which you'll see tonight uh, these workshops like you're doing now. And the key thing that's different here is that we're looking at this one-on-one -on -one technical support. We're really starting with, you, you know, helping to address growers nagging issues, some of their bottlenecks and working backwards. And in three years, we're really shooting for 375 growers to um, really meet one-on-one -on -one and help to um, get these projects off the ground and complete them. Uh, to reduce food safety risk and increase efficiency and uh, basically uh, run a sane and uh, well efficient farm. And the key things we're doing, it's a hands-on approach. We're really starting with where you are, uh, focus on your bottlenecks. Again, increase uh, it, our decreasing risk and uh, increasing efficiency and flow from field to customer and really we're hoping you plan and implement solutions in this kind of flow. So there's all sorts of problems that come up from fields to uh, harvest, storage, wash pack, transport, you name it. And um, we're in the wash pack tonight and really looking at how to make things work uh, super smoothly there. So um, I will uh, put in the chat in just a second, if you haven't downloaded it, just uh, this planning template. And it's a great idea now or afterwards to uh, jot down your plan and like what you're hoping to do with a bubbler and we can follow up and help you on a, in some kind of one-on-one -on -one fashion. So that's it. Thanks Hans. All right. Yep. 
All right, I will take over now. So looking at the chat responses, we don't have many, um, but we have someone that has been using a bubbler for five years, have one individual looking to uh, create one. They've got the parts, they're ready to go. And uh, we've got some bubbler adjacent folks that work with a lot of farms that do have them. So keeping in mind that some, some people might watch this recording later and not having experience with bubblers, I want to give a brief overview of what a bubbler is and how it's used and some of the key features. Um, so in short, it's a, a useful tool for not only efficiently, but effectively washing produce that might accumulate soil or debris or insects or insect feces um, in, in hard to wash places. So, you know, thinking about crops that can't be adequately cleaned through dunking or spraying, washing them with a, a bubbler might be suitable. Um, we'll circle back to that later to determine uh, which crops actually make most sense to wash in a bubbler. Uh, in my experience, I see a lot of growers using them to wash leafy greens, lettuce mix, head lettuce, kale, chard, that sort of thing. Um, so basically your bubbler is going to agitate and, and circulate the water in a tank. And um, as those air bubbles are rising to the surface and that water is moving around, all of that soil and debris is going to be hopefully gently loosened from the crop. Uh, so at its core though, a greens bubbler really doesn't require a complicated setup. Um, you need three key pieces a tank, a blower, and a PVC manifold with holes drilled in it. And this manifold is what's going to direct that air through the, throughout the tank. Um, as far as tanks go, uh, growers have used large 100 gallon stock tanks, IBC totes, stainless steel stock tanks, evaporator tanks. Um, ultimately, you need to consider the volume of produce that you're going to be washing uh, when determining what size of tank uh, you need. You want to think about the durability of that tank. Um, and of course, the, you know, we're talking about food safety here. You need to think about how you're also going to clean and sanitize it. So some sanitizers might be more corrosive than others. And over time, they might degrade um, that, that tank um, material. And then with blowers, you also have a range of options here. So most frequently, um, we see growers using spa or jacuzzi blowers. Some folks use shop vacs due to their multifunctionality on the farm. Uh, when choosing a blower, you really need to consider the size of the blower that's going to be appropriate for the size of your tank. If your blower is too powerful, um, you might wind up with quality issues so crops could become bruised and with that damage, let me replay this again, with that um, dam damage, the risk of infiltration of, of wash water into that crop is going to be greater. And with too much power, you might also run the risk of water splashing out over the sides of the tank, which could maybe create slip hazards or simply add to all of the cleaning you have to do at the end of the day. Um, and then finally, with that PVC manifold, you're going to want to be able to disassemble this well enough um, so that you can adequately clean and sanitize it. So only some of the pieces of the manifold are going to need to be glued together. And I believe Andy um, Chamberlain will go into an alternative way you can connect your PVC pieces later uh, when we talk about key improvements. Um, but really, I don't want to share too much more than that on design because we have two very knowledgeable growers on the call with us today to share their experiences and their designs. Um, so actually, Rich, if you are ready, um, we'd love for you to jump in and perhaps first share a bit about McCollum Orchards, where you're located, what you grow, um, and then move into talking about your bubbler setup. Sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Rich Woodbridge. I own the Column Orchards and Gardens. It's a, it's a farm in the city of Lockport, New York. So Lockport is right between uh, Buffalo and Niagara Falls. Uh, it's been in the family since 1827. Uh, so, uh, but it was actually totally overgrown after my grandmother passed away and my wife and I moved here to 
to, uh, to take it on. And it was a big project. And we didn't really know what we were doing when we were getting started. Um, but that was back in 2011. And so it's been 10 years now and we've grown it. We've had several iterations, but it's, um, we now have a 150 member CSA program. Um, we, we actually have three, tun three high tunnels now. I think there's just two in that photo there. Um, we grow for the local market and we sell to local restaurants. Um, our CSA is a pickup, so people come on to the farm um, and it's, it's kind of like a market style where they get to pick and choose what they want. And then they have about an acre of you pick herbs and flowers and you know, green beans and stuff like that. And so it's been, uh, it keeps us busy, uh, but we've we started moving out, doing a lot more work with, uh, with greens, uh, lettuce mixes, especially Salanova, um, spinach um, as well. And uh, when, we, when we moved there, uh, the place, the newest building was built in 1882. Um, and so our, our wash station, it was, it was in an old loading dock for the apple packing shed um, that they used to have there. And the, uh, the ground was all pitted. The concrete was just kind of worn away and uh, it was just kind of a mess. And so um, we, we poured a concrete floor just to even it out because we knew where we wanted our wash station. Um, and then after a few years, we just kept having birds fly in and we couldn't get them to come out and they just love um, roosting on all the lamps and, you know, dropping things everywhere. And so um, it was two years ago that we enclosed it. Uh, so I can open and close both sides of it. And then there's screens in the, uh, along that front edge, as you can see. Um, and that, through that, um, we've been able to create a pretty efficient system. Um, I was following uh, some of, uh, I read the, the Lean Farm and uh, was following some of Michael Kilpatrick's work in, um, in wash station setup. And so I tried to mimic some of that and um, I've been pretty happy with it. Uh, again, we, we've got, if you look at the setup, um, there's, we have two dunk tanks, hundred gallon dunk tanks. I've got a bubbler. I can actually set it up. So it runs both of those tanks at once. I've got a, a three basin sink with a spray table. And on the left-hand side, um, is the spinner. Um, I've got room to put a second one in. If we're doing lots of greens, uh, I'll run a second spinner. Um, but that it was a big bottleneck. Um, and so, you know, the person who was stuck at the wash pack station was just washing and packing all day. And, was getting kind of frustrated and all the bins were just piling up from all of us harvesting in the field. And so we did a major redesign just to take the pressure off of the person doing all the washing and packing. Um, and so we can still keep it down to one person washing and packing, uh, but they're not nearly as, as stressed out. And um, yeah, we have drying racks that we can move around. Uh, we did buy a, um, a roller system, one of those like rolling conveyor belt type things that Kind of expands out accordion style but it just didn't work the way we we're hoping it would and so we do use just roller carts to move produce around uh, i was i was really hoping roller systems would work but it didn't um we also usually put if someone's there for a long time we'll put those anti-fatigue mats down that you find in restaurants that have lots of holes in them but they those do collect a lot of dirt and a lot of standing water and so we try not to keep those on the ground for too long uh, but yeah, the way we did the setup, we got power up above because it doesn't get wet. We've got a water line further down below. Um, and all the water that hits the ground, if it does, it just slopes right out. Um, and uh, yeah, it just follows the slope of the, the grade and it just goes underneath to the right hand side and it just drips outside of the, uh, the building. Uh, it's three season uh, just because I couldn't get water there because um, it's about four feet off the ground. I couldn't get water that wouldn't freeze up into there. So in the wintertime, I do bring a bubbler in the three basin sink into, um, into my greenhouse and it works well enough. It's not great, but it, it works pretty well. Um, is that the video? Oh, okay. This is, these are the pictures. And so, so yeah, I mostly do a um, lot of greens, uh, but sometimes peppers if they're super dirty. And today I did broccoli because we got a lot of cabbage worms in there and I just, I can't handle picking them all out. They're disgusting. And so I find bubbling them for a while, having it sit and bubbling them again, they all drop to the bottom while the broccoli floats to the top. So all the worms sink, broccoli floats. It works pretty well. It's not great, but it's good enough. And that's good enough for me. Um, but, uh, and we've tried lettuce heads and Napa cabbage and it tends to knock the leaves off of it. And so I don't do as much head lettuce in there 
even though it'd be so convenient, um, it's just too aggressive. And I haven't figured out a way to reduce it. Uh, uh, change the slide. Um, so this, I think I talked about it in the video, but um, if any of you have used those Rubbermaid tubs, there is about an inch of standing water at the bottom at all times because their drain hole is, is about an inch higher than, than the base. And so it just gets disgusting. You have to take like a wet dry back to get all the water out. Um, and it's easy for my employees to forget to clean that out. So it might sit for, or you know, it had been sitting sometimes for a weekend or almost a full week of just standing water at the bottom edge. So it's not good. And so um, what I saw is following some other, some farm on Facebook and they just did a one inch hole at the bottom and put a bilge plug. These are uh, for boats. So it's a marine bilge plug. It's, it's uh, grass, so it doesn't corrode. And just when you, when you bend it, it makes the plug fatter. So you just put in the hole, bend it over and it plugs the hole up really well. When you want to drain that bottom inch off of it, just flip it back up and pull the plug out and that bottom inch of water just drains out. So I've been really happy with that. And so um, this is also a design I found on a small farm university, uh, Michael Kilpatrick. And so I modified it a little bit, um, but before I had, uh, I've been doing bubbling for like five years and originally I had the the PVC resting on the bottom, um, and I had um, cinder blocks holding it down. So you have to have some weight to hold it down; otherwise, it just floats up when you pump water or pump air through it. Um, but the cinder blocks were not food grade. I couldn't ever clean them as well as I'd like because they're super porous. Um, and so I saw this design, which I like. And so it actually rests about five inches above the uh, the bottom of the tank. Uh, on the there's a kind of a, a higher up rim that goes around the bottom. And so it rests on that. Um, and so when, if you're washing something really dirty, all the dirt sinks to the bottom and you're not churning, constantly churning that mud and dirt back up into your water, just settling down. Um, same with the insects. And the whole system's held down with just uh, these stainless steel uh, C-clamps on the right and left-hand side. I don't think you can see the left-hand side one. Um, and the, the shape of the tub um, actually holds all the PVC together. And so the, there's only like, I think one or two joints that are actually um, glued together. Everything, once I take these PVC, or take the uh, C-clamps off, I can lift it up and the whole thing comes apart for cleaning. Um, there are also holes drilled at the underneath side of the bubbler of all these tubes, so water drains out. Uh, so I'm not having standing water inside the tubes. Um, let's see, I don't think you can see on the, on the right-hand side, but there, I actually have a screw plug on the right, um, just so I can get a, a brush in if I need to on the right-hand side. On the left is the uh, is the uh, jacuzzi blower. On the right is a screw plug. I have forgotten to uh, to tighten that. And I shot water about 20 feet onto the ceiling, um, so it's you know you live and learn. But um, but yeah, and then I've got a, a Hudson float valve um, to fill up the tank because it was taking uh, my employees about seven minutes just holding a hose, and they would just stand there and hold a hose for seven minutes to fill the tank. And so this thing, um, it'll just shut off once it gets to a certain height. And it's nice because you'll, um, you know, as you've been washing a lot of greens, um, you're taking water out of the tank because it's stuck to the greens. And so the water level goes down. This thing will just keep refilling it to the same level. Uh, you do have to watch out because sometimes it'll get clogged and keep flowing. Um, so it's good every every month or so just to open it up and see if there's anything clogged inside there. Uh, but, but that I've been really happy. Turn on my camera. What's that? And then, um, yeah. And so I've been, we used to use, um, like laundry, not baskets, but laundry, uh, laundry bags to scoop things up and put them. We have a, a modified, uh, washing machines as a spin, spin dryer. Um, but the bags were, that's definitely not, food safe. We're trying to go, you know, as food safe as possible. Um, and so it was really hard. You'd have to, to launder the, 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 those laundry bags uh, to keep them clean. And so we just switched over to a basket system. Uh, so we just, you know, if you're doing leafy green, greens, um, you know, lettuce and spinach, it all floats to the surface. So, so you can scoop it out with these laundry baskets. Um, if we have a lot going on, we'll, we'll have it drip dry on these, um, on, on these racks. And then you can show the next page if you want. And then, yeah, it's, uh, then we put in the, the modified washing machine, which is, um, it's a lot, 
it's not ideal, but it, there's there's moving parts, and you know I have to make sure employees aren't wearing really baggy clothes because I'm petrified of them getting snagged on something, or you know I could, I guess I could file off those handles or something, and so they don't hit their hands. But I don't like the, I don't, I'm not in love with it, but it works really well. Um, with the baskets, I can't, I can't dry as much as I used to with the laundry bags because um, I could just really stuff the laundry bags and they would just spin around the sides, but they were touching the sides of the drum. And so that required me to clean the drum all the time where the baskets are a lot easier to clean. But if they, if you spin too much in the baskets, it'll just kind of, the centripetal force will pull the, uh, the lettuce or what have you up and out. And so you can't put too much in the basket. So it's, it takes a little longer, it takes a, you know, because you're putting less in each basket, but it does work really well. And then you take the basket, you put it onto um, into a clean, a clean bin right next to it, and and then it goes to cold storage. Uh, I think this is the video of it. So if you have any questions beforehand, I can, or, or well, we can do questions after if you'd like. Perfect. Eighty, and it had a loading dock. Um, yeah, here works. on the left, uh, but we were getting a lot of birds coming in and stuff like that, and so so we closed it up. We uh, poured a concrete floor with a slight slope. And, um, and put a ramp in, and that's become our wash station. It's a three, three season wash station, spring, summer, and fall, but uh, we can't get water there in the winter time. So that, that's been our issue. And also we have a ramp here because the cold storage is actually in this building, the old stables next to it. And so we do have to haul the produce a little ways, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, so we'll go up the ramp. So the first thing is where we put our dirty bins. Um, so we try to keep them off the ground. We have pallet risers. And so all our dirty bins, our field totes and our packing totes go here. And once a week, uh, we have a high school kid come by and pressure wash all of them. And so we got sliding doors. Uh, this door in the back is actually, uh, that's, there's a ramp on this other side and that's where we load the produce from. So we go come from the field and bring it in in through these doors and so we just have a kind of continuous flow in the back corner here we have the um the clean bins that we do uh, that we'll have for uh for putting the clean the washed produce in after we after we wash it uh right here is our drying rack and so we do have it's just a uh, a wooden table but i got these six foot long um or they? They're, uh, they're shelves from Webstaurant. These are food grade shelves from Webstaurant. Um, and so they work pretty well. They keep the produce clean. I can wash it off very easily. And that's where we'll drip dry things. So if I'm doing something like lettuce heads, I will, um, I'll dunk them in, you know, might not be a bubbler, but I'll dunk them in a uh, soaking tank and then hang them upside down or put them upside down here to, to drip dry. And again, this floor is, um, it's tilted and all the water kind of drains out underneath here. Um, in the fall, I can close it up a bit. I just put two by fours underneath there to close it, but that's where all the water goes. Uh, we do have screens here uh, just because, as I mentioned, we have bird issues. And so they do trap insects, unfortunately, like the insects get stuck inside, but it keeps all the birds out. And on this wall, we've got two stock tanks. Uh, I've got the bubbler set up in just one of them, but I do have, I can make it so it bubbles both at the same time. Uh, I've got Hudson float valves in here. And so these, if I turn the water on, these will just fill the whole tank up to that point. And um, I have them off to the side just because they were getting in the way. Uh, when they were in the middle, so they're off to the side, but it just, it automatically fills the tank. Uh, normally it would take about seven minutes to fill up this tank. Um, and that would be one of my employees kind of hang, hanging out there with a hose monitoring it, and now they don't have to. Um, so that saves some time. We use our uh, baskets for getting uh, the lettuce greens and stuff out. Uh, this is the bubbler setup um, that I did. So we got a bubbler, there's a switch up above, um, and I've designed this so it's off the ground. It's not touching the floor of the stock tank. It's slightly above it, uh, just kind of riding on the, 
on the rim around it and then it's locked in with these uh, stainless steel C clamps. And so uh, when it does fill with air, it does, you know, there's a lot of upward pressure, but those C clamps keep it down. And this keeps you from, uh, from churning up all the dirt sediment that falls to the ground. Um, and a new feature we put in this year, as many of you might know, that it's, you know, these drains that come with the stock tank are about, um, they're about an inch or so above the floor of the stock tank. And so water just doesn't flow out. So what I ended up doing was drilling a one inch hole down at the bottom. And this is sitting on, um, on cinder blocks and I have it sloped slightly toward that way. And then I use these uh, bilge plugs for boats. So this is a, uh, it's a brass bilge plug. And basically you just put it in the hole. Let's see if I can, it just fits in there and then you bend it backwards and it squishes that uh, that plug and makes it wide and then it just fills in um, that gap and then you've got a nice plug. So once I drain everything out through this hole, once I'm done bubbling, and I go through, lift that up, wiggle it out, and the rest drains out on the floor and then I've got a nice dry tank. And so I don't have standing water like I used to. That used to be a problem. We used to have to take a wet dry vac and suction it out. Now it just dries, dries on its own. Uh, I do have a three basin sink and I've got a, one of the jet spray hoses there and I got again this Webster on shelving on top just so I could put radishes or whatever I'm just spraying the roots off of um, and it just cleans it really well. If I'm doing a whole bunch of carrots with uh, stems I'll take it outside um, and I'll have another table set up like this and just spray the carrots off. Um, so again there it's on a pretty food safe surface. I do have a uh, mobile cart, and so I can move uh, bins of, uh, of whatever I'm packing around and actually ultimately take that all the way down my ramp to the cold storage. And behind me, I've got the, uh, the salad spinner, the modified uh, dishwash or uh, washing machine, and um, that works really well. Uh, I can set it up so I can have two going at once, but this time of year, I don't have that much in the way of greens, so I just have one uh, going. Stainless steel table for resting bins, sanitate, um, and then I've got a foot pedaled uh, hand wash sink that uh, we actually put in during COVID just to uh, make sure employees wash their hands. But it's it's nice to have in here so everyone has clean hands while they're handling the produce. And then we've got a mobile cart of just our cleaning supplies. And um, so that's it. I've got uh, the lowest, uh, what's that, four feet of the building is uh, washable walls um, and then I also put that right above the bubble tank just in case I've got um, you know spray back uh, but this system has worked really really well for us this year and um, I've been happy really happy with it I only wish that uh, I was able to put cold storage in the building so it was right next to us but I just can't because of these old buildings um, and so I do have to walk it out take it down and put it into cold storage in here. And then during CSA day, take it out and bring it up to the share barn up there. So it's a lot of hauling. And then also to the right, we've got our barrel washer. I'm gonna be moving that. So it's gonna be under a roof um, over here. Uh, so it'll be covered, keep birds off of it. And um, I can get electricity easier through this window than doing an extension cord all the way out here. Uh, but that's it. Um, yeah, it's worked really well for us. It was a bit of an investment to uh, to build this. It was about oh, about four thousand dollars or so to enclose this old uh, loading bay, but uh, it was well worth it. Yeah, and I don't have too much more to say beyond that. Um, the only thing I still have trouble with is uh, dosing okay, candidate, and so and I'd love to hear some suggestions on how best to dose. Um, to use Sanidate, I use Sanidate 5.0, but it's, you know, it's pretty toxic. I don't want my employees to get it splashed in their eyes or anything. And I haven't found any good dosing me mechanism to do it right in the, in the uh, hundred gallon tanks. So I don't know what other people are doing, but I'd love to hear some, some feedback on that. Thanks Rich. We can definitely follow up on that too, um, after this as needed. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Rich. Yeah, we can save questions um, for 
after our other farmer uh, has a chance to present. So Sherry, if, if you're ready, could you go ahead and share a little bit about back porch produce? Um, and then we can progress through the, the slides of your bubbler setup when you're ready. Looking at the aerial is kind of cool, uh, but we actually have four high tunnels now instead of the, the two um, that you see there. Uh, we were about three and a half acres, uh, mostly vegetables. We're transitioning over to an acre of elderberries right now. Uh, we're located in Farmersville Station, uh, which is also called Centerville. It's out by Rushford Lake. It's a very rural area. Not sure how many slides I sent you. I, I apologize. I don't recall how many we sent. Uh, we, as you see in the slide, we choose to use a smaller tank because I find it encourages more changing of the water. Uh, like Rich had said, uh, dirt gathering in the bottom is a problem. Uh, I definitely like his, his approach with having the, the, the piping up higher in the bottom, whereas we're still currently using bricks to keep it off from the bottom of the tank itself. Um, as you see on the wall there, there are some stainless steel, oh, I don't know, what would you want to call those? Uh, they help lift some of the greens out. Uh, the table itself was some salvaged wood that we use. Uh, it does have food safe paint on it, which is unfortunately quite expensive. Uh, looking at that picture, to kind of back up a little bit, what you see in the very right hand side there is a roll up door. Uh, outside that roll up door is an outside rinse station to get dirt off uh, root crops like carrots, beets, turnips, etc. And then we move it into this area to wash. With the bubbler, uh, after the bubbler, we go into a washing machine that is also modified as a spinner. Uh, we too use the plastic bins instead of the mesh bags so that we don't have to clean the drum of the washing machine as much as we used to. <clears throat> uh, from there, it goes to the left, which is a dry and rack that we created over the winter that we have been very, very happy with. Um, it was just a simple creation out of wood. Uh, the rack is hardware cloth held in with screws and washers. And up above on top is simple box fans that point down onto the drying rack. Uh, the rack itself is on casters. So when things are dried, uh, the whole rack itself is moved over about eight feet to our pack tables. Uh, we do have metal walls. Uh, this is a brand new pole barn that we built last year. Uh, it is a dual purpose because it is also a uh, state inspected commercial kitchen. And one of their requirements was washable walls. So we decided to go with the metal, thinking that that would be easier to wash bits of dirt and vegetables that might get on the walls off as well. <clears throat> Sherry, those are all of the photos I have from you. Um, feel free to share more. I, I do have a question. Perhaps I missed it. What crops do you wash with your bubbler? Just greens? Uh, mostly just greens. Uh, I find that radishes go through there fine if they've been rinsed off outside first and they're already um, banded. Uh, their leaf and tends to hold up better in the bubbler compared to say carrot leaves don't. Uh, we have, for a wonderful reason, I guess, a high market demand for green tomatoes. So we do actually put our green tomatoes through the bubbler, uh, but it does sit on uh, a plastic rack so they don't bounce off the bottom 
and then sweet peppers as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, at this point, uh, before we move into talking about cleaning and sanitizing, I just want to open it up if anyone has any questions for our growers um, or other experiences they'd like to share in using a bubbler, crops that they've washed, materials that they've used. Okay, well, hearing none, um, we are, we'll go ahead and, and move into talking about cleaning and sanitizing. Um, do remember though, you can always put your question into the chat box though. Uh, so thank you, Rich and Sherry for, for sharing that. Um, it was good to learn more about your setups. Robert, if you are ready, we're gonna move into your piece now. Sure. Yeah, the, this is like the, the least favorite chore uh, probably for everybody, um, but it is, it is really important. Um, is looking at uh, cleaning and sanitizing uh, everything. Um, that you're working with, keeping those um, uh, food contact surfaces um, clean uh, so that you're reducing the risk of, of contam bacterial contamination. Um, when, one of the questions I get asked quite a bit, uh, cleaning frequency. Um, I mean, ideally, I think it's you know, at the end of each day's use. Uh, and I know that is easier said than done. Um, and uh, every, everybody has their own schedules for, for doing things. Uh, my, the, the, the reasoning here um, is that if you're, um, it's easier to clean something um, that is still, still wet and fresh than it is uh, if it's dried on crud. Uh, and the best example of that is, you know, making sure, you know, you, you cleaning your dishes, uh, letting it, if you let them pile up for, for a few days, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of things dry dry on there it makes it um, you know a, a lot more scrubbing required to, to get everything off. Um, it, it becomes a real pain, a real nuisance. But it, it's also it, it's it's a lot of time to, to to do that. So if you if you can start off with you know if you can keep everything that that that's wet and, and not not stuck on there, you can rinse rinse it off and and clean things. Uh, you know, the, it, it's it's time well spent, but it's it's a shorter amount of time. So, looking at um, what kind of you know, and having the right tools uh, can can help make the this go uh, a, a little bit easier, a little faster. Um, you know, so you know, rin rinsing everything off using water. Uh, you know, that's from a from a a known safe source, um, and uh, if need be, using detergent. Uh, that to help get off, um, you know, anything that's um, any residue, uh, oils from from some of the vegetables. Uh, peppers can can be a little oily sometimes, um, and uh, and and then and and scrubbing off what what um, as as whatever you need to, uh, and getting it into all all the spaces, you know, everywhere where the where where food is going to come in contact. Um, and then um, you know, there's, and that we'll talk in a second about about brushes um, and things. Uh, and then using sanitizer when you're all done, rinse everything off, come back in with a, a, a sanitizer labeled for food contact surfaces. Um, you know, it, it might be the same type of sanitizer that you that you used in your water uh, while you're while uh, the bubbler is running, or it might be a different. A different concentration, but reading the labels, making sure that you're you're following those directions, and and that it's an, an approved product for the job that you're doing. So these are uh, some some of the tools we've used uh, on our bubbler, um, and it's it's starting up on, on the on the top there. It's just an assortment of of, of brushes uh, that that seem to do a pretty good job. The, the, the red handled white top one there is um, is a tank brush um, and then the, the uh, it's specially designed for doing inside of, uh, of, of uh, dunk tanks and and it's for is made for the food industry uh, it's a and as, as well as the, uh, the the large red bottle brush that's there as well they're they're manufactured by uh, Vican they're European 
um, made, but it, it's, it's, they have really uh, fantastic designs on there. And I think we'll talk about a resource uh, about brushes uh, towards the end. And the, the, uh, it, it, the, the head is rounded uh, and curved in the right places. So it, it fits in, into, into corners very well while also getting the bottom. Um, and it's, uh, you can have handles uh, that, that fit uh, you know, to the length that, that just makes the job easier. The, uh, the, the flexible brush a little bit uh, lower there um, is um, either, um, you can get these uh, online pretty easily as uh, dryer vent brushes. They're flexible, quite flexible. They're good for getting in, in inside of uh, in the pipes. And then uh, a variety, you can buy small bottle brushes that help uh, as well. Um, or, you know, just a, a, one of the things that uh, also that we, we like using uh, is having our, bot, uh, our products, uh, you know, just whether it's, it's clean water, detergent, or sanitizer in, in spray bottles. Um, so just easier to get, you know, everything's pre-measured as needed and, and you can spray right in there, color coded. So it's, uh, you know, it's not mixing things up. Next slide. So this looking at a, at a manifold uh, and, um, and, the, and the, in, um, the blower pipe coming out of a jacuzzi motor, uh, on our design, uh, it's, it was a, a two piece pipe so that we could take it apart and clean it easy. Uh, as mentioned before, um, not, gluing all of your joints together, uh, but sewing, um, creating it so that you can take it apart and you can get in there and clean them out easily. Um, and using the, the, these brushes in the, the lower, lower right um, photo, uh, we've got that flexible brush. It's going in one end, it bends right across, as you can see. Uh, you, can, you can see that the head of the brush um, in, in, uh, through the hole there. Um, the uh, the red bristle brush is uh, it, it's it's wider than the two inch PVC pipe that's there, uh, so it gets in there. It, it's stiff. It's got a really long handle, uh, so you can uh, you can you know depending on how long your pipes are, you can really you know fit these these in there uh, and do a good job. And, and, and it 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 really cleans the entire tube very very quickly. Uh, then also uh, the, the small bottle brush, uh, that was a half inch uh, stiff bristle bottle brush, uh, cleaning out the holes sometimes, you know, depending on what kind of, um, uh, you know, how much soil or debris uh, it, that gets in there, um, it, you may have to clean out the holes periodically. Next slide. So uh, yeah, as a close up of those holes, that's there. Um, and, and using that, uh, the, the tank brush in there, as you can see, it, 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 fits, it, can, it, it fits in the curves there very nicely. It, it's nice and stocky. It's got some, some heft to it. Uh, it's, it's, it's stiff bristle, uh, but it, 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 can do, it could do really great job uh, getting things that are stuck on. Uh, you know, so you know, hopefully you don't have to, uh, you know, if, you, if you're cleaning, often enough uh, that you don't have to, to really scrub too hard. Um, and then on the bottom there, um, you know, uh, you've seen some, some fo um, folks using um, baskets to clean, uh, to, to pull out um, leafy greens out of the tanks. Well, you need, you know, don't forget to clean those uh, as well. Uh, getting, um, you know, that's a food contact surface as well. So we wanna keep, keep that, uh, you know, that those, those need to be cleaned. Um, and, and kept uh, away from you know, uh, any contamination that, that, that could enter there. So, so we'll talk about uh, designs uh, right now, as a matter of fact. So- Yeah, but before, we, before I stop sharing, um, or maybe I can go ahead and start stop sharing and Chris uh, or Andy, you can get your slides together. Are there any questions about cleaning and sanitizing um, by chance? This is Chris. I had a question for Rich, actually, um, relative. I love the bilge plug idea. I'm wondering whether you're using any sanitizer in your water and how that's uh, gone with the brass. Uh, yeah, I've been using the um, Sanidate 5.0 uh, 
um, there is tarnishing on the breast, but I don't know if that's just from wear and tear or for me grabbing it um, or acids on my, my hand or if it's from um, the peroxide. I, I don't know what peroxide does to it um, or I don't even know what material the bilge plug is made out of. Um, you're probably not supposed to be sucking on that. So, um, but, but in terms of, you know, pathogens, it seems to do a good job. Yeah. But, but, but honestly, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd have to stick it into the sanitate and just do, run a little experiment, see what, what happens. Yeah. But you, you haven't seen much corrosion, for example. Or anything. No, that's no, awesome. Just, just tarnishing. Thank you. Great. Any other questions at this point before we proceed? Quick question for Sherry um, from Hans here. Uh, just curious uh, it, it, if you, so that small tank, stock tank looked great. It's cool. I actually haven't seen anything that small with a, with a bubbler. And I'm, I'm curious, like the volume you're running through there and uh, what made you decide to switch to that versus a, you know, a stock tank. Um, but just, just real quick, if it, um, around that would be would be awesome just because we haven't seen um, that. Um, a lot of the items that are around here are made to fit my strength and abilities. Um, things are made to fit my height. I'm tall for a female at five foot ten. So we've made a lot of the benches higher, a lot of the racks higher. But that smaller tank um, that builds plug is a, a great idea I'd never thought of. There's often still water in the bottom of a, a large tank. So I switched to that smaller tank because I couldn't dump the bigger tanks by myself. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to talk about key improvements. We have Andy Chamberlain with us from UVM Extension. Uh, Andy, I'll Go ahead and let you introduce yourself and um, a bit about the work that you and Chris do. And uh, yeah, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Kaylin. Um, I'm just confirming you can see my slides all right. Yes. All right, thanks. Um, good evening. I'm Andy Chamberlain from UVM Extension, um, and I focus in ag engineering and focus even more specifically in the pack shed. So um, nice job tonight guys on the on the pack sheds we've seen so far those are those are excellent examples and uh um have a lot of great tips that uh we like to to share and educate on for produce safety so so nice job um tonight i wanted to share a few things on building a greens bubbler and some upgrades to consider from my perspective as well so we came up with this idea, how can we take the greens bubbler that's common out there and make it better? So I, like another farmer, picked up a, a Rubbermaid tank and strapped it on the back of my Subaru and got to town. Um, a couple of the key points we wanted to consider uh, and address was electrical safety. And then the other key point was hygienic design. And hygienic design means uh, a few different things, these five points below, but I kind of think of it as just cleanability and the ability to be cleaned, if you could have another word for it. And the five key principles of hygienic design is that you need to have all surfaces visible and reachable, smooth and cleanable. There's no major collection points where debris or crud or mud can build up. Everything's made of compatible materials, like Chris mentioned earlier with that plug, you know, if there, that was a sign of corrosion. Um, oftentimes, you know, stainless or plastic is, is great because they can withstand um, the sanitizers and things we might throw in there. <clears throat> and then having a design that prevents contamination so you're not introducing other chemicals or uh, physical hazards or anything else into the design. So... I, I took this to mind when, when designing a bubbler. So when I got started here prototyping, you can see I, I've got duct tape around the PVC as a temporary um, you know, apparatus just, just to hold things together because 
press fit the pipes just didn't work unless you cut them at just the right length and squeeze them into the tank snugly. Um, so obviously I wasn't gonna use duct tape permanently, but just for experimental purposes. Also, you can see in this photo that the apparatus floats, which was a problem that we needed to address with hygienic design because we didn't wanna drill uh, into the tank. We didn't wanna add any additional pieces that we didn't necessarily have to because it's just one more thing we have to clean around. So that was something that I kind of wrapped my head around. And one thing that Chris and I came up with was adding in some cam locks. They're like $15, you know, 10 bucks for one side, five bucks for the other in order to purchase these. So there is some added cost, but they're super convenient because press fitting the pipes and components together is great so you can take them apart, but then if they're not squeezed in the tank just right, they can blow apart, which is frustrating. And then trying to take them apart, if there's any grit or debris in between them, can be like trying to separate a stack of five gallon buckets. And unless you've got a really good grip on them, pipes don't always come apart very well. So I was trying to come up with a way that doesn't require tools, but doesn't require gluing everything together because taking it apart to be cleaned was uh, a key consideration here. So I came up with this idea for using cam locks. I hadn't seen anybody use this in a bubbler system yet. Um, so if you look in the lower left-hand side is kind of the manifold part. And I glued that together knowing that the bottle brushes that Robert was showing can get inside those elbows and clean those out. And then the long pieces are easy to clean because it's just a straight shot and it's all, um, all these easy to access. Those end caps are currently not glued on, um, but I think I could glue them on if they were blowing off and causing problems because a bottle brush could get in there just fine. Um, but being able to remove them is, is another benefit. Now, the question came up about whole size and quantity. So I ran a couple of tests here. I started off, um, I actually started with eighth inch because I thought that would seem about right. And then I went smaller. I drilled a bunch of holes that were 16th inch. And as you'd expect, it makes smaller bubbles, which is slightly less aggressive. So maybe if you're washing some microgreens or more tender crops, a smaller bubble might be a good idea. That being said, it may not have been as aggressive as needed for trying to wash the, wash the worms out of broccoli as, as another example tonight showed. Um, but then I did another experiment where I went to the other side and drilled some quarter inch holes and that just made really big, really aggressive bubbles. So I think going an eighth inch is probably a good happy medium. That being said, I'm an extension educator. I don't have a farm to wash a bunch of greens in and haven't been able to test that yet. But based on my hypothesis, that's, um, that's where I would go to start. I drilled holes every inch along both of these horizontal pipes um, so there's about 20 holes in that section, and there is not any holes in the elbows of the manifold, but I suppose we could add some if, if we want to. So this is a look at the apparatus inside the tank. Um, I had heard from another farm, they used capped PVC filled with sand as weights to hold it down. And I concluded that that worked quite well. I could get 12 pounds of sand in a 24 inch piece of pipe. And then dropping that pipe into the tank, you can see kind of sits in between the, the grooves we'll say, or the moldings in the tank. So that piece doesn't really move around a lot. I think I could get away with just having one uh, right on top of the right side, but I added a second one on the left just to make it more stable. And then any bubbles, it doesn't seem to really affect the the flow of the bubbles around the one that's that's on the left. Um, the downpipe also can be disconnected via a cam lock as well. And here's just a quick clip of it working just to show what, it, what I came up with. Um, now, I'm not done on this project yet because there are some upgrades I'd like to do and there's more things I'd like to implement. Keeping it off the bottom is a great idea. I didn't think about that until, until you mentioned that in this meeting, so thanks. Um, and keeping it out of the mud is good. Holes on the bottom of the pipe too for draining, also a nice tip. And 
I also noticed the standing water on the bottom. So I found after I drained it out, I'd have to tilt the tank, let it drain some more, maybe dump the tank, which yeah, even once you're down to the last gallon or so, it's still big and bulky tank to lift and, and muscle around. And I don't want to snap the, the drain valve off the bottom either. So that's something you to be mindful of. So I think I'll be adding a, a drain plug straight on the bottom. Uh, and then there's some electrical upgrades and uh, the downpipe I'd like to, to tweak as well. Because right now you see it's just a stiff pipe sticking straight up out of the tank. It's not held down by a, a clamp uh, like you showed, but I do like that idea, except then you need tools in order to remove it. So that's kind of one, one thing I was holding back from, from doing. Um, this also keeps the electronics a little bit too close to the water for my comfort. I'd like to move them further away. So one thing I am looking forward to trying is um, a flexible hose or a discharge hose often used on irrigation pumps. I, I had been trying to use lay flat as a drain line, but um, had to determine that it likes to kink going through the thresholds of the door outside of the lab. So that was kind of a pain in the butt. And these drain or discharge hoses are more of a stiffer rubber. And I think I could use that both for the drain hose and the bubbler line. And that would allow it to be flexible, taking the weight of the pump off of that downpipe. So then just the, um, the apparatus in the bottom would hold better. And then that would allow me to relocate the blower off on a wall. Same with the switches off on a wall, like 20 feet away. So add some cost, but I think it would make a really clean install. So that's where I'm going next on my experiments. Um, next, I just wanted to share, I'm not going to show you this video, but you can go check it out afterward. It's um, about eight minutes long and it, it walks through um, everything I just talked about, but uh, has a little bit more action shots if you want to see a, a few more detailed images of where I'm at currently. Another video will come after I play with different hoses and things and, and continue to refine, but uh, here's some of these quick learnings, uh, hot off the press, fresh on YouTube. And then cleaning tools. Uh, I also just wanted to mention, um, thanks Robert for calling them out. These are just a few more different bottle brushes. Um, these are sold by the brand Vican that he mentioned as well. Um, they're available in all different lengths as well. So you can get short handled ones, long handled ones, depending on your apparatus, all different diameters to fit whatever tubes you've got. And then they all, that curvy one is kind of made to go around the outside of the pipe too. So um, just another tool in the toolbox. Uh, we've got a good summary on cleaning tools. If you visit the short link at the bottom there, go.uvm.edu slash cleaning tools will take you to a whole blog post talking about all the different options available from, from Vican. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was tank stands. Uh, earlier it was noted that cinder blocks are hard to clean and they are. They're really cheap, they're ready, readily available, and they're about the right height for, for a wash tank, but should be considered temporary. And having some nice stands made up uh, would be great. These stands, uh, are actually designed so you can get a pallet jack underneath them. So if you need to move it while it's full of water, you can. Another addition that I have yet to see but would be nice would be a couple pegs off the side so you could maybe hang some of your tubing off of that to dry when not in use uh, or a little kickstand to hold the tanks not only on their side like this but uh, up a little bit more so they can, they can drain out that last little bit of, little bit of water if needed. Um, and that's, that's just another shot of the tank brush that I think is probably your go-to tool for, for cleaning this style of um, equipment. And all of this plus way, way, way more than, than what I had to speak upon in, in these 15 minutes, but a lot of the tips that Caitlin, Robert, and, and the farmers already shared is summed up here in a new resource on our blog you can visit this go.uvm.edu slash bubblers or our blog is that short link slash ag eng to get there. And um, so you can count that as, as your notes to this meeting if, you, if you're looking for more info.
Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, a couple of us, at least me and one other person, were wondering, what if you alternated the whole size and had the, the eighth inch and the quarter inch? What, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you could totally do that for sure. Um, that would get, definitely give you different sized bubbles. Um, you, you also could have different pipes for different crops too. So you could um, have a couple sections like that, especially if you have the cam lock style and just swap them out, no tools required. Um, yeah, you know. The other thing, Andy, you didn't, didn't really um, bring up is we, we've been messing around with using a dimmer switch, a light dimmer switch for, to make that blower variable speed. And by doing that, you now have another thing you can adjust for depending on what you're what you're uh, bubbling. Um, so in the guide that Andy referred to, we've got uh, a circuit that shows um, how to wire in both a timer switch and a dimmer switch. So that also, Rich, if you're looking to free up that employee, you know, you set it on a timer switch, variable speed to adjust, dial it in for the crop you're doing. They can walk away and do something else. That's a great idea. Slowing it down saves a little bit of volume and, and energy, which is nice. Cause that's what and, that's a common complaint is that they're really noisy. So and, you know, yeah. And, and that was the other, the other thing we looked into was it seems like a lot of people are hesitant to move the, the jacuzzi blower too far away because, you know, they're worried about losing pressure and flow. And we actually, I think we, we said you could easily go 50 feet with two inch PVC without losing uh, pressure or flow um, that you would notice. So there's, there's room to get that the heck out of the wash pack for a lot of reasons, um, electrical safety, but also just noise and comfort ergonomics um, as well. No, uh, we've worked with the grower that has it up in the second story law. I mean, it's like a completely separate space and just super quiet um, coming down through the ceiling. Works great. Now, I had a, I was toying around with the idea because uh, I, I can drain most of the things through that little hole that I have at the bottom of my tanks. But I was wondering what if I pump the air through the hole that's already provided by Rubbermaid and just use their already existing threads to to hold something down into there. Um, I haven't played around with that, but I thought it was a potential option. Um, so I could just, I don't know, just, uh, just another way to, to hold pipe down in there. Because sometimes you don't want two bubblers, like a bubbler going on both sides of the tank. Sometimes you just want on one side so it'll turn the tank around and around. Uh, that helps with some leafy greens. So um, I don't know, maybe this winter I can play around with it. Did have one grower say they they did that and they they moved away from it, but we're we're waiting to find out why. I think Andy, unless you you've learned that in the past sixteen hours. <laughs> uh, well, a couple comments. I heard um, that one grower benefited from kind of having a dead zone on one side because it allowed some of the smaller bugs and things to separate out. So that's it's not always bad to have a dead zone or, like you said, kind of creating some churn. Um, I was trying to experiment a little bit with hole orientation as well, um, but without actually washing greens, I couldn't really tell whether I should have the holes going up, kind of pointed up towards the sides of the tank or directed towards the center to kind of get that rolling action going. Uh, yeah, Chris mentioned that one farm that he had been using a bubbler and a big uh, maple sap tank for a couple of years, but he's recently... He, I reached out to get a picture of it. And he's like, yeah, we haven't really used it in a year because we've really just refined our greens growing operation to them not being that dirty. So they can just kind of do a single dunk and that's fine. They don't need that added agitation. So I think a lot of their greens production is uh, all in a greenhouse. So it's really controlled and coming out really clean. So that's, uh, you know, another way to lean up the farm is <laughs> not use it if you don't need it. Yeah, also, uh, and just another idea that I had, I'm, you got University of Vermont and you've got uh, Cornell University, um, which has some sway. I, I don't know if anyone's actually reached out to Rubbermaid and say, hey, can you move the drain hole down um, on stock tanks? Uh, they might be open to, to that once they know how many farmers are using them for, for washing. Uh, but I haven't reached out to them, but I think it would take an effort on 
multiple fronts for them to, to, to notice that and make change. I'll do that. Good Great point. Idea. Never hurts to ask. Yeah. yeah. Just a comment on the, uh, on the tank brush. Uh, if you're going to order one, be sure you order a handle that is made by the same company because it, it, the, the threads on that brush head are <laughs> European and it doesn't, it doesn't fit American handles. Uh, so you need, need a Euro, uh, one of their uh, European handles to, to fit, which is, um, it's, the handle is almost the same price as the head itself, but it, it's a, it, 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 that handle will last a long time for sure. Well, this is great conversation, everyone. Um, and I don't want to rush us. So if there are more questions and comments, I want to give us space to talk through some of these ideas. Just to um, Hans's and Jeff's point about drilling an additional drain hole, maybe a larger drain hole in the bottom of the tank um, to either go over, go over another um, an existing floor drain or something else. I mean, we've, we've had good luck using um, flush mount bulkhead drain fittings for other purposes too. And I know some growers have done that in the bottom of these. And then you end up with a threaded connection that you can hard plumb wherever you want. Um, but it's, it's a bit easier to, you get more of a complete drain, a bit easier to clean. Um, so that, that's worth another, another thought perhaps. So Chris, would it, wouldn't it make sense to use something like the bilge plug for that? So if, uh, in, in Rich's case, he's draining to the floor, his floor drain is his primary drain outside. If someone doesn't have that option and wants to go into a drain, you know, predictably into a drain, a spot drain or a floor drain, um, they may need to go somewhere with it, it with plumbing. And so mm -hmm. getting it into a threaded connection that goes out the bottom of the tank could be helpful. So a, that type of fitting would, would do that. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Andy, one question for you is um, that that down tube coming in that was flopping around. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, what if you took a a couple of um, like those yoga blocks, the kind of hard closed cell foam and cut some notches in them, put it around and then use like a carpenter's clamp to, you know, quick, um, you know, uh, quick clamp to kind of secure that thing and steady it to the side. So it's vertical up and down and uh, steady. Uh, how does that sound? Uh, with the weights on the bottom, it held pretty steady. Um, because I angled and glued that pipe to follow the contour of the tank. So it can kind of rest on the side of the tank. Oh yeah. Um, and definitely while experimenting, I, I certainly used quick clamps and, and wood clamps and things, but I find that that's like one more thing to, to fuss around with on wash pack day that yep. if we could avoid it, be ideal. Especially Andy, because most of the weight is in the, is in the jacuzzi blower. So if, if we if we right. get out of thinking that that has to be right at the tank, hard you know attached hard to hard plumbing, and get that into flexible tubing, then most of the weight is the weights. So right. you know <laughs> yeah. so and, and I agree with Andy. It's one more if we can minimize the number of things we need to adjust and connect. I think that's ideal. So I, I would imagine flexible hose coming from either ceiling or wall, popping onto a quick clamp, going down to the manifold you've taken away almost all the weight. That's awesome. Then you just have to counter counterweight the, uh, the floating PVC and, and the air current, but that's, uh, that's not a five pound pump, four feet in the air, leveraging, <laughs> levering out of the right. water. Yeah. And I think it would be, it'd be terrific to get that noise out of there um, as well. Um, and then, you know, and then being able to wire in uh, like the, the, the timer, the, the timer option is really good because you want to be sure that, that that pump gets turned off as needed. Uh, I think I've shared a story before. We, we, uh, one of my growers uh, was in a hurry to, to get things washed and set to get, bring to market and left the jacuzzi motor on and it ended up burning, short, shorting out, burning down his wash pack building so being able to turn that off and, and, the, and the timer idea is just just fantastic uh, on that because you just set it and, and and go off 
and 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 you can you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's going to go off on its own. And then and being able, you know, using the dimmer switch or uh, is, is another terrific point uh, on there is to, to adjust and, and adjust the uh, the aggressiveness of the bubbles. I think that would be uh, another terrific uh, addition. I definitely know a few growers who have sort of stopped using their bubblers for a few different crops because they're too aggressive. So I, I would agree. That's probably a great, a great idea. Okay, we just have a few more slides to share with you all. Um, Andy, you already covered all of this, but <laughs> as another reminder to everyone, we do have some new resources we've put out. Um, you can visit the scrub resource page. I have a QR code um, at the very end that can connect you there, or you can just visit that link that Andy shared. Um, I think Chris might have shared it in the chat as well. Um, but in addition to the blog post and the video, Robert and I have created a, uh, a handout or a fact sheet, if you will, on best practices for cleaning and sanitizing um, your greens bubblers. We're also going to provide a editable, editable Word doc um, uh, for a, a standard operating procedure so that you already have a template that you can just simply tweak a little bit to work for your farm um, and your setup. So moving forward, I think we're going back to you, Robert, to talk about next steps with, <laughs> with the planning template. Part of the, the, the scrub um, project um, is, is, is to have our folks who have attended our, our, uh, our events here uh, to, to, to make changes um, on, on their operations. And, and we would like to know about it. And we'd like to know how, you know, you know how, what you've done, um, how, you know, what improvements you, you, you look to, to make. Um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, documenting that with some before and after photos, if, if possible. Uh, and there, there's a template here uh, that was, um, there's a link to that, that was uh, to, um, in with your invite uh, for tonight's meeting. Uh, so you can you can download that and and, and fill that out and get it back to us, um, and and so you know it would be great uh, you know the, the the sooner the better that if you you know want to uh, get that together and, and get it back out, um, or if you have more questions, uh, if you're looking for some one-on-one -on -one assistance. Uh, depending on where you are, it could be, you know, you could be just down the road from us or it, it could be virtually, uh, whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes. Um, so uh, that would be, uh, that, would, that would be great. I uh, would lo love to follow up with you um, and, and hope that, to take, that you can take this information and, and do something with it. And, uh, and we'd, we'd like to, like to see, see what that is. And so if any more, any further questions, uh, this is the, the, the code uh, that uh, Caitlin was referring to, um, to, to, to get out, that, to get to the resource pages, um, UVM blogs, uh, great information there. Um, so we, we'd love to help you. Uh, I mean, it, and does anybody have any, any further questions uh, about tonight's presentations? I know I, I have one for, for, for Sherry, if she doesn't mind. Um, telling us more about her drying rack. Uh, I, I think it's just, um, you know, how does, you know, how do you use that in, in the whole process of, 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 you know, one person washing and, and, and going through, uh, you know, washing the greens and, and, and working with, with that all the way through your process. You said you can, you move that around. And so how long, how long do you keep it uh, on, on the rack? Um, do you, you know, do you, do you find that you have to adjust the, the height of the, of the fans or uh, did you, did, you, did you experiment with that to see, see how much force of air uh, was needed? You know, just, just things like that. It, it's, it's a really interesting uh, piece of equipment you have there. I find I use different speeds on the fans. Uh, in particular, spinach does fine on a higher speed, but things like arugula, if they dry too quickly, of course, they wilt and there's no recovering from that. Um, usually, I can take 
and put three of the five gallon baskets onto the rack of of whatever, whether it's leaf lettuce. And if it's the fan settings on the right size, <clears throat> by the time I have gathered whatever was in the bubbler and moved it to the washer, it's already time to take it off the rack. Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, um, anybody have any other questions? I, I just want to thank the grower presenters tonight uh, for, for sharing your, your setups. There's a lot of very, clearly a lot of thought going into them and um, a lot of patient trial and error. Um, and I, I really appreciate what you shared with us. Uh, it's really inspiring and helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And I too want to just piggyback that, you know, the real, the real uh, force behind this whole project and enthusiasm is really around, uh, you know, it's, it's risk reduction, it's produce safety, it's efficiency, but, you know, really it's around, you know, just how to make your work uh, really efficient and rewarding and do a great job. And so how do we figure all this stuff out? It is trial and error. It's getting together like this, sharing ideas, opening to new things, trying things out. And um, we're definitely showing that right here. I think that's, this is how, how it works. This is how we're sort of moving the needle on this. There aren't a lot of engineers out there in the world that are, you know, thinking through all this stuff. It's, it's really um, you all here and the, the folks, folks on this call and other folks like us and you all that are doing this work and it's a benefit to everyone. So thank you all. All right. Well, I think that concludes our Twilight Highlight. Um, we are we have recorded all of these workshops. Um, those can also be found on the UVM Scrub page if you'd like to go back and watch previous recordings. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about anything related to Wash Pack, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. We're here to help. <laughs>